Thank you for downloading this podcast. My name is Richard Rucroft. You're listening to a special episode of Gnostic Lectures. My host today, Mr. E. Jim G. Ross. How are you, Jim? Fine. Thank you, Rick. Thank you again very much for inviting me to be here. It's been a long time since we've uh, done a recording, but uh, we're going to continue now. You're hoping this will be a series of three lectures. So the title is Sex, A Stairway to Heaven or A Stairway to Hell. This is part one. What, uh, what would you say to introduce this topic, Jim? People already know about sex, don't they? Yes, yes. Well, most of people, you know, actually don't agree in, in just one interpretation of sex or sexuality, you know. Even within the scientific world, there are discrepancies regarding their perception of sexuality or sex. So we are going to divide this session into three different chapters, you know. Today is part one. We could say uh, we're going to approach a scientific research done by common scientists they were not into esoteric knowledge, and they, they were not even spiritual, they were not even religious. But, curiously, through scientific research, through their own experiences, they discovered a strong relationship and a connection with spirituality within sex, and also religiosity within sex, and also esoteric approach into sex without knowing it. So can I say something here? Of course. There have been lots of people in the past who have experimented with sex. And I can think of two people in particular, Rasputin is one who was uh, about a hundred years ago in Russia and also Nikola Tesla. These two people are very, very well known in history. Tesla as a young person experimented with uh, sex, uh, but he didn't have gnosis. He didn't understand Gnosis. The, the knowledge of Gnosis was not available at that time. Neither did Rasputin. So they made mistakes, right? Yeah, well, uh, one way or another, you know, they were very close to an esoteric approach. You know, understanding that esot esoteric approach means a combination between science and religion or matter and spirit, finding the connection between spirit and matter. Instead of dividing both, they were finding a connection between spirit and matter because we are all composed of spirit and matter, all of us. And the whole universe is composed of spirit and matter or electricity and water, which is everywhere in the universe and within our own organisms also. So these two individuals, you know, even they look separated from, you know, this very deep kind of knowledge about sex, about sexuality, they were walking towards the same objective, finding, you know, a deep explanation about sex. What is sex? You know, and this is why today we are going to enter into, well, trying to also understand, you know, better uh, this uh, monk from Russia, and also the scientists, you know, this... Uh, uh, Nikola Tesla Nikola and Tesla. Rasputin, yeah. Yeah, well, they were, you know, they were different. They were different, but both were using a percentage of this hidden knowledge about sexuality, which is part of esoteric studies, deep esoteric study, because there are many pseudo-esoteric groups that don't get there, or they have a different approach into it. So... Both, you know, were not so wrong. Both were moving into something more advanced. You know, if we really believe that there are, there are superior beings within the universe, and we call them, you know, angels, archangels, Elohim, according to the Bible. Well, according to Gnostic anthropology, Gnostic cosmology, and Gnostic psychology, those superior beings ascended from our actual level of consciousness, our actual level of being, into higher levels of being. And a superior sexuality had to do with it. Understanding that the sexual energy is the same solar energy that lives within the universe 
emanating from the sun, from the stars, and also emanating from our own genitals, from our own genes. It's our own electricity. It's the same sexual energy. Now, going into history, recent history, uh, let's talk about the, the end of the 1800s. There was a group in the U.S., in New York, you know, actually called Oneida Community, the community Oneida. And they lived in New York near the border with Canada, uh, near, you know, Niagara Falls. These people, at the end of the 1800, they lived in a community and they had discovered already a method of birth control. It means that they wanted to avoid pregnancy, unwanted pregnancies. You know, there was a, f a, a very known Mexican scientist. We are not going to mention his name because what he said is a sentence that we can hear everywhere. This Mexican scientist said, I'm here on earth because my father had a night of passion and my mother decided to keep me alive. She didn't want abortion. So here I am. So I'm here because of an accident of life. Nobody wanted me at the beginning, but I'm here anyway. So this group, the leader of that group was Mr. Noyes, Noyes, John Humphrey Noyes. You can find his name in the internet and the community Oneida, O-N-E-I-D-A, existed for real in New York State. You know, there were 200 people who lived there in a community and they experienced for more than 30 years, you know, men and women having sexual relationships and, you know, avoiding pregnancy. Only when they wanted to have a baby, they, they had an orgasm. They experienced, you know, ejaculation. And according to their research, because every day of those 30 years, they wrote down what was happening to them. And they discovered that the children that came from that community, they were all geniuses, people with a superior IQ and also a superior emotional intelligence. And they realized that by doing it, having sex without losing their sexual energies, learning to connect, and instead of doing it in a quick manner, they spend time together learning to love, really love each other, a man and a woman. They discover that they increase their vitality. They increase resistance to illness. The immune system became stronger. They increased mental clarity. And the children were procreated with conscious responsibility and also awakening love for each other. Man, woman, husband, wife, and even children. They loved their children when the children came. And they realized that we are the only animal within the animal kingdom who loses too much, too much sexual energies in a sexual act. Approximately, we lose 7 million spermatozoos in every ejaculation when we need only one to procreate a baby. And that's exactly what they did for 30 years. And this research was already controlled and also re-studied later, at the beginning of 1900, by many other doctors. For example, you know, there, is, there was a book, there is a book, maybe you will find it, written at the beginning of the 1900, called Rejuvenation, written by Professor Dr. Walter Sigmeister. And that book described the experience of the Oneida community in New York. Later, a worldwide famous professor, doctor in medicine and chemistry, Professor Stegnach, also from the U.S., continued with the same research and also supporting what this Oneida community had done. This book, Rejuvenation, was translated from English into Spanish language with a different title. The person who translated was the lady Clemencia Rath. That lady was also a scientist. So basically, they spoke in that book, Rejuvenation, 
the importance of regeneration of our vital energies within marriage, within keeping youth alive, keeping younger, through a new technique and a new method to regulate birth control. So, at the same time, they describe in that book that the anti-conception practices of the past, and even the modern ones, have been in, in a constant failure. The cause of many abortions in Europe, the US, and even Canada have been the cause of many deaths, ladies who have died because of an abortion. And also, they also convince themselves that life begins at the moment of conception. So people who were against abortion, that was their conception, their philosophical and also biological conception about abortion, that they were against abortion, because life begins at the moment of conception. In France, Lyon, Professor Lacassagne, a French scientist, he said that in his city there were more abortions than birth. Dr. Talmay, a doctor from the USA, doctor in gy gynecology, he described this new method to procre procreate as an excellent method. Margaret Singer and Walter J. Robinson, American scientists, they also spoke about abortion and even they tried to defend abortion saying it was a needed bad practice because of the failure of anti-conception methods that led women into septicemia purpural, which is also death, a total contamination of their genitals, where infections killed the potential mother. They also described the ogino or ogino nose method, where they talk about the sterilized, sterilized period. They also fail because some people believe that certain periods, you know, you can have sex without getting into pregnancy. Other methods including many pills, kind of pills, generated serious illnesses within the female genitals. Dr. McCann, F. J. McCann, a gynecolo gynecologist from London, England, wrote a few books. One of them was called Anticonception, Common Cause of Many Illnesses. He also spoke about side effects on female genitalia, because of anti-conception methods, methods, another book. A third book he wrote, titled was Dangers of Anti-Conception. And book number four, The Treatment of Female Common Illnesses. They are all connected with the same problem. In the US, Dr. Gile, he wrote about uterine, uterine tumors because of anti-conception methods as side effects. Professor Himes, he also was against what is called the coitus interruptus, which damages both sexes and also could generate pregnancies not wanted, plus creating mental and nervous illnesses which affect both couples. What about Professor Micker? Serious damage to prostate and uterus. This other lady scientist, Violet Feith, she wrote the book called The Problem of Purity. And she described there the destruction of our blood vessels because of a wrong way of having sex. Now, many other scientists, members of the Carnegie Institute in Washington, D.C., Dr. Carl G. Hartman and Dr. Robert D. Dickinson, they described the failure of the ogino ogino nose method. Dr. Latz from the same Carnegie Institute, he said the rhythm fails when there is emotional disturbance, when women are nervous or they are worrying too much. That system that has been considered, considered, you know, good to avoid pregnancy, it failed. Supported by Dr. Francis Seymour and also Dr. Janel, they were all members of the Carnegie Institute. Washington, D.C. So, coming back to Oneida community, this new discovery, considered as such, of birth control, created by 
Dr. No John no Noyce was reinforced by his son, John Humphrey Noyce. You see, and he reinforced the discovery of his father after 30 years, after 30 years, where, you know, he supported, you know, this discovery. So, Dr. Theodore Noyce, medical doctor, the son of the founder of the community, published at the New York State Medical Gazette, this serious research done during 30 years. Now, Dr. Van der Walker, a gynecologist of Syracuse, New York, observed the impressive stage of health of the 42 women of the community. They had called this method male continence method, also published at the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, called titled A Gynecological Study of the Oneida Community. And they described that even the labor stage after pregnancy was amazing because pain was diminished at incredible levels. So it means women had less pain or no pain. Dr. Havelock Ellis, in his studies of sexual psychology, declared that John Humphrey Noyce, creator of the Neida community, was one of the greatest reformers in eugenesics. What about Dr. Robert Dickinson, an authority in birth control, who declared, the experience from the Neida community, as my judge, my own judgment, is the unique experiment in birth control with purpose, conscious and organized, realized by a group of intelligent individuals, knowledgeable of the human mission, which is to fulfill the category and imperative task of our own species, added to magnificent medical monthly health results by professionals of health. Can I ask you a question? Did I hear you mention eugenics? Eugenics has a very bad reputation, doesn't it? No, eugenics. Eugenics? Oh. Reformers in eugenics. Yeah, you're right. But it, I was a reformer okay, of yeah. that approach into science. Okay, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, Go. he actually, you know, was against that approach. Okay. Now, another scientist, Professor Norman Hines, expressed in his book called Medical History of Anticonception. He said, the Oneida community system is the eugenic experiment of greatest transcendence verified in all centuries. You see, so basically, this method or this new technique about sexuality was very much into procreation and also how to increase affection and pleasurable experience for a husband and wife, for a man and a woman. So he called, you know, his method the great liberation. And he wrote an article called Masculine Con Continence or Self-Control During Copulation. He said this is all natural. Really, no one member of the animal kingdom wastes its seminal fluids as we do it. Ejaculation or orgasm generates a short pleasure and after it exhausts vitality and brings disenchantment in couples' relationships. So the orgasm, if we really analyze scientifically what happens after we experience that, even if there is a short pleasure, the disenchantment comes after. And this is why couples, after a few years of being married, they are not enchanted anymore with each other. And this is one of the causes. Something to meditate about it. Now, this same technique developed in the US, in the United States, by the Oneida community, traveled the world and moved to Europe. And there, German scientists, Italian scientists, French and Swedish, and you know, all kind of developed countries in, in Europe, in Europe develop the same technique and they call it, they baptize it as carezza method. It's an Italian word. Carezza means touching with tenderness in Italian language, carezza. So basically 
is the same experience of the Oneida community, but developed in Europe. So it was developing sexual relationships, found them in exploring new avenues to reinforce respect and love between couples. But also emanating from this, they developed something called the Diana Method. Diana Method was something into applied into new generations, into teenagers who are awakening into sexuality. And based on also scientific research, you know, men and women are not ready to procreate babies unless a woman is 18 and a man is 20 or 21. And the trouble is today we can see in our modern world, you know, children having babies, women who are only 12 become mothers and men who are only 14 or 15 become fathers. And of course, they are not ready psychologically and not even physically to bring children into the world. And of course, there are so many children abandoned already at a very early age. And this is a, a collective tragedy all over the world. So the Diana method, the Diana method, inspired by the Oneida community, applied to younger generation. The purpose was mainly to avoid pregnancies between younger couples. And based on the same concept of touching each other with tenderness, but avoiding genital connection and even penetration, that would avoid ejaculation, of course, and orgasm. And its main objective was to re-educate younger couples into having respect for sexuality, respect for pregnancy. Because if life is sacred, sex shouldn't be also considered sacred. So by doing this, you know, touching each other with tenderness, this younger couple will learn to increase their attraction for each other as a base for a longer or even a lifetime relationship. Can I say something? Of course. I don't agree with that at all. I think uh, uh, people will always uh, degenerate into fornication if they do this. So that's my opinion. No, essentially, you know, they were like a, like a, it was the same Karetsa method, but developed, you know, develop if grown up people were able to control themselves, men and women working together, cooperating with each other mm -hmm. to avoid pregnancy. The idea was to educate the younger generation through their groups organized all over Europe. I remember I met here in Canada, I met a clinic that was connected with Caressa Method many years ago. They are no, nowhere any longer, I don't know where they are, but I spoke with some ladies who were doctors and they, they talked to me about this Caressa Method. So, and they were very much into re-educating younger, younger generation, teenagers, about the Diana method. You know, because the, this is the point, you know, you are a young man and a young girl, you are only 14 and the, your girlfriend is only 12, and suddenly she becomes pregnant. What is the solution? Abortion? Well, what if the girl decide not to have an abortion? She will have a baby and her life will be ruined because She's too young to become a mother. She's not ready. She's a student. She will have to quit maybe high school, you know, and the boy maybe will walk away from the relationship because he's not ready either. And we will bring children into the world to suffer. And this is why the title of this lecture, you know, the three lecture is sex, a stairway to heaven or a stairway to hell. Isn't it connected with hell? bringing children into the world to suffer, who are not wanted. And of course, the children will grow up with a lot of bitterness because they will know that nobody wanted them. And also, maybe they will jump into criminal activities or a very bitter kind of lifestyle. Don't we see that is happening all over the world already? Because it's not only poverty the cause. There are many wealthy families where children are not wanted. Their parents are too much involved into the business and they forgot their children because they were never wanted. They were an accident of life. You see the point? So this is why either we agree or disagree with the Diana method. <laughs> I believe it's more intelligent than just jumping into sexuality without knowing what it is. You know, as we said, if life 
is considered sacred because life is something to be respected. Then sex, which is a way to bring children into the world, a way to procreation, actually the only way to procreate, because in a laboratory we cannot reproduce sperms or ovules, you know, or eggs of a woman. We cannot. We can, you know, scientists believe that they can replace Mother Nature. They cannot. They cannot. So essentially, we are the ones who produce the germ for life. But if we are not responsible, we destroy ourselves. And this is why, isn't it the cause of war when, when people are bitter? When a family hates each other, when a child hates his father and mother. You know, when there is a war at home, this is also the connection with the war in a city or in a war in a country or in a war between countries. You see, this is the connection. There is a strong connection. And we are not talking about religion. We are not even talking about ethic. We are talking about survival. Survival. Just survival. This is a very, as I said, this is the, the lecture number one of, the set of, of, a, of three other three lect uh, lectures in total based on the same topic. Today is about common science, common scientific approach. The next one will be a religious approach based on ethics. And number three will be a combination of both, which is science and religion and esoteric knowledge, which is a, the highest you know, perception about sexuality. Coming back into Caretza now, there, there are books written and, and they, one of the scientists in Europe they call it uh, Dr. Walter Lust. He wrote a book called The Art of Making Real Love. Caretza. The Art of Making Real Love by Walter Lust. You can find it, you know, through the internet. There was also a worldwide Caretza movement developed by a lady, a scientist. Her name was Marnia Robinson. She wrote books one of them was Peace Between the Sheets. And another book was Cupid, Poison Arrow. That was written recently in 2009, this lady. So Marnia Robinson and Gary Wilson wrote the books together. Now, there was another scientist, a lady that was a Quaker. Quaker? Quaker? Uh, she, uh, her name was Al Alice Bunker. Bunker from Stockholm, from Sweden, a medical doctor. And she also, you know, developed the same technique, wrote a book called Ethics of Marriage. So now we are moving into a religious, more religious approach. She inspired by the book of John Humphrey, Noyes, who taught concept called male continence. A doctor, Dr. Stockham and William Lloyd wrote the Caretza Method. And they spoke about return to equilibrium. And these books, apparently, they are free at the internet. Books about Caressa, written by these people. So they describe their intercourse, sex, between a man and a woman, has to be slower, never to take pressure on it, in a more relaxed manner, re-educating ourselves regarding sexuality. Sex, but without the orgasm. Genital connection in a gentle manner, never searching for an end. So the orgasm became less and less rewarding to understand that clearly. And this is, this is, this has, now we are moving into a connection with religion. This has a strong connection with the Taoist sect, Taoism, which is an ancient religion from ancient China, before Buddhism and before Hinduism. And in Tibet, they call it White Tantra, Buddhism. In India, Kundalini Yoga. But it's also connected with ancient Egypt and ancient Greece. You know, and also the teachings of Moses. Moses described in his books, Alchemy and Kabbalah and the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments are connected with Christianity. So basically, all this relationship between official science or common science and religion are very important because in, in the book of Leviticus, the Bible, Moses describes the Ten Commandments. 
and he speaks about fornication and adultery. The, the sixth commandment is no fornication, which is actually losing our semen, ejaculation, orgasm, and adultery. Adultery is having more than a sexual partner. And this is going to be explained later. Now, Jesus Christ developed the same concept through the seven deadly sins, where lust, lust is a combination of fornication and adultery, or having a wrong sexuality, which is today a common sexuality. What is that? So I mean that common people are wrong, the immense majority of humanity are wrong. Is it possible that most of people can be wrong? The answer is yes. Now, the alchemists persecuted by the Inquisition, they spoke about this. The Kabbalists persecuted by the Inquisition, the astrologers persecuted. They all spoke at that time of coitus reservatus. We are not talking about what happened recently in the year at the end of the 1800s. We are talking about something that happened thousands of years ago. They spoke about coitus reservatus, sexual alchemy, you see, and Kabbalah. So that is a strong connection, you know. There is a coincidence there, something to be meditated about it. Now, there is another book written about the same topic. The title of the book is Love, Sex and Nutrition by Dr. Bernard Jensen. And he said, to attain the most exalted state of happiness and fulfillment, it is necessary to help someone else to get there too together. So you see, so basically here we can see that there is a strong connection between now we're moving from common, common, you know, science, common ground, and there is a strong connection with what Dante Alighieri said in, in Inferno. He described, you know, nine infernos and nine heavens. And number nine, number nine, you know, in the Tarot and Kabbalah, is the ninth sphere, which is sex. This is something to be studied later in our next lecture. So Dante Alighieri knew about this. And now if we study some Gnostic books like The Perfect Matrimony, written by Samael on Veor, we can find that book on this website, www.gnosticteachings.org. Samael on Veor said sex is the creative function. So, a concept to be developed, of course, in a higher level. There is also another book recommended connected with Jewish religion, a book titled The Secret Teachings of Moses, a book written by Aunel Vadaaz. You can find that book. Can you spell that for us, please, yeah, Jim? Yeah, it's a A like Apple, U like Universe, N like Nora, E like Edward, L like Lion, Second word, va, is V like Victor, A like Apple, das, D like David, A Apple, A Apple again, T Thomas, H Hugo, Aunel va das. And you can find that book at www.gnosticteachings.org. So, this is the point. Now, if we go into Sigmund Freud, Sigmund Freud perception of sexuality, he said something interesting. He said, all religions have a sexual root, something to be analyzed. You see, now we are going to have a little taste of, you know, a little taste of religion and a little taste of esoteric studies, Gnostic, actually, Gnostic anthropology, Gnostic biology, Gnostic sexuality. Gnostic sexology. This is uh, extremely important because if we analyze the title of this lecture, sex, a stairway to heaven or a stairway to hell, try to, let's, let's try to, some, many people don't believe in heaven or don't believe in hell. Okay, let's accept that. Can we create heaven here on earth? Can we create paradise on earth? The answer is yes, yes. Do you know how many billions or trillions are spent every year in the business of war? We would be able to eliminate poverty. We would be able to create jobs everywhere. We would be able to create a better kind of health 
a superior kind of hell. We would be able to create paradise on earth. But instead, why are we doing the opposite, creating hell? I've been in a war myself, with all respect to our listeners. I've been in a war myself. I know what it is. I'm telling you, it's pure, pure hell. I was very fortunate to stay alive after that. I became a prisoner of war. I was a civilian. And I was lucky enough to be able to escape from that inferno. So I know what it is. I can speak clearly about what a war means. And I could see faces of people. When you are in a war, you develop hatred, a horrible hatred. What is that hatred coming from? You know, isn't it because we develop an imbalance within ourselves? We said at the beginning, you know, when this Oneida community and also this Karetsan method, they speak about bringing back the balance through a sexual relationship. And this is a, fu a fu fundamental, a fundamental perception of reality. We all, we are all involved into that. We all came here because of sex. All of us, the entire human race are here because of sex. You know, don't we, don't we feel that there is a strong connection between physical, physical paradise and physical inferno here on earth? Don't we feel that we destroy the balance because of losing our sexual energies that gives us life? Aren't we aware that we are made of the semen of our parents, physical parents, man and woman, and also the semen of our ancestors? So is the semen something to be wasted? When, if we want to procreate, we need only one spermatozoa and not seven millions in every ejaculation. And we committing a crime against ourselves, against nature? And we destroying ourselves? Don't we feel that the Cadessa method and also this uh, community, Oneida community in New York, were walking towards a superior kind of lifestyle regarding sexuality, regarding procreation? They said they, through their research, they discovered that their children became geniuses through the years. You know, can, how can we prove it? Well, the only way to prove it is by experience. And if we train ourselves to do it, we can all do it because we are designed to do it by Mother Nature. It's a matter of, you know, practice. If you don't practice, you will never know. And also, through practice, you can experience. And those couples who have done it, they know exactly that their relationship gets stronger and stronger a loving relationship, and even some of them learn to adore each other. Right now, doctors and biologists are being taught in universities. It's a very incomplete perception of reality, very incomplete. And this is one of the causes. We need a new education about sexuality. We need, we need a, new appro a new scientific approach into, re into that kind of reality, because it's a fundamental reality. You see, we develop an imbalance regarding our lifestyle 24 hours a day. And isn't this the cause of that imbalance? You see, we are going to explain that, you know, later within the next two lectures. But right now, right now, you know, this is only an introduction into a discovery by scientists who are searching for a, a better kind of lifestyle regarding sexuality. And also they discovered it was much more pleasurable, much more pleasurable than just having common sex. Can I say something? Of course. You mentioned before, to me anyway, that uh, the vast majority of women in the world think that their man is like a one minute man, right? But uh, having sex correctly could very well mean that you're together for a very long time, in some cases, maybe even hours, right? That's correct. Actually, you know, um, according to Gnostic anthropology, our, our scientific approach and scientific strong research about it, we know that the cycle of a woman is around an hour. So a, a woman will be satisfied without reaching the orgasm also, but connected with the man who has respect for her, who cares about her, and in a gentle manner they are connected sexually for one hour. 
approximately, more or less. Both will be fulfilled completely. They will be feeling they are in heaven together. So that way sex will be moving us together, the entire human race, into higher levels and you have of to, health. You have to always separate before the urge to ejaculate or have the spasm comes on. You have to separate. Right? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. When people feel when they are not trained properly, when they feel the orgasm is coming, they both stop. And also the movement have to be reduced to the minimum. Because in reality, what it is recommended, and this is what the Oneida community discovered, they spend time together. They spend hours together. They took a bath together. Maybe they gave a nice massage to each other to relax each other with, with a nice, maybe relaxing environment, a, a relaxing music, maybe. And also, you know, learning to make love, learning to love each other in a respectful manner, because if there is no respect, there is no love. You know, and these people discovered that, but they were blocked by powerful groups, scientific groups that didn't like the idea. And even today, today, you know, we have pornography. It's an industry, very powerful business that don't agree with this, of course. They could never agree because they make their money by doing the opposite. So this is important to be understood, you know, to be comprehended. What is it that we want? Do we want to continue living in hell? where most of people live in poverty, where people have trouble at the end of the month to pay their bills, when, you know, we create wars because something is wrong with our psychological behavior, and instead of loving each other, we learn to hate each other since a very young age. People hate their children. I'm sorry, children hate their parents. Parents don't like their children because they were never wanted. You know, people don't like their neighbors. Neighbors don't like the rest of the city, and the city don't like the rest of the country, and the country hates the other country, and here we are at war. And the people hate the government, and the government hates the people. That's correct. <laughs> That's totally correct. That's to so something is wrong with us, you know. And we are not talking about esoteric stuff yet. We're not even talking about, you know, religion yet. But just a little taste of religion. And this is connected with Moses' teachings, you know. In the sixth commandment, said he said, we shall not fornicate. But he knew about it. He knew about the secret. He knew that when we lose our semen, we create an explosion within our sexual organs that will affect the entire organism. And that way we destroy the entire immune system. And also this is the cause of all illness. All illnesses come from ejaculation of the semen, from the orgasm, male or female. It's hard for most people to comprehend that. In the beginning, you hear these words that um, fornication is the cause of all human suffering and illnesses and everything. In the beginning, you don't want to accept that because it's new information. You, you think that oh, they can't be right, right? Yes. But then as you learn more and more, then you begin to understand the deeper significance of illnesses. You know, are, are we, yeah, we live longer, but are we, is the quality of our lives better? You know, are we, you know, what's the point of living till, till you're 95 or 100 years old and you've got pain all the time? Or you have a tube shoved up your nose, right? I mean, that, that's it's correct. ridiculous. You know? That's correct. Well, you know, according to Gnostic anthropology, we know all illnesses without exception from the common cold into cancer and AIDS, they all come from losing our sexual energies through the orgasm and through ejaculation. You know, and this is very, very important. And again, we are going to continue with this information. But on the other side, we also recommend to pay a visit to this website, www.gnosticteachings.org. There you will find a lot of information about that about, you know, esoteric information and also spiritual information connected with religion. And even what we have just said, which is common knowledge through, you know, through the internet and also through scientific research. So, Jim, you've mentioned in the earlier part of this uh, recording, you've mentioned that uh, 
various books written by various people. We're not really recommending these books to people. We're recommending recommending basically GnosticTeachings.org, right? Well, I would recommend both because, you know, we have to create the bridge between esoteric studies because what's, what's esoteric study? Isn't it science and spirit, matter and spirit working together, becoming making it one, one superior kind of knowledge? So the trouble is humanity has separated science from religion. There is a divorce, actually. Many religious individuals, many priests and pastors and reverends, they don't like science and they become fanatics and dogmatic. And on the other side, scientists become atheists. And the, the main cause of being an atheist is that these religious individuals who are fanatics and dogmatic, hard to, toler to be tolerated. So both created a tremendous separation between science and religion. Now, esoteric studies are the opposite. There is a, a perfect communion between science and religion a perfect communion between matter and spirit. As we said it before in other lectures in the past, alchemy and Kabbalah are connected with it. Alchemy is the study of matter and its purpose within the universe. It means the purpose of matter is to transform because matter transforms anyway, but we can produce that scientific experience within our own organism. How do we transform our own material organism into and a spiritual organism. And also, after we, we are doing that, how do we learn to make the scent, our superior capability of being a spiritual, into matter to create a fusion? The spirit descending, crystallizing into matter, and matter spiritualizing, becoming one with the spirit. You see, and this is the tragedy, and this is pure esoteric science, pure esoteric knowledge that we are going to dis develop in our lecture number three. This is only our lecture number one. This is only a very primitive approach into sexuality, but different than the one being taught in universities and different connected with those teachers who educate their students into sexuality, providing them with condoms, you know, and pills, when in reality they are not making it a revolutionary approach and also more realistic approach into ascending as a species into higher levels of consciousness, wisdom, and loving capabilities. This is the problem. Do you have any, any question? In my view, what you've uh, outlined in the early part of the lecture was every Tom, Dick, and Harry who wrote a book on sex basically has um, discovered little portions of what Gnosis teaches, but yet not one of them, not, not any of these books that you've referred to have the total picture. Of course not. Yeah, so. Of course not. No, that I agree with you 100%. But the point is people, teachers of sexuality, psychiatrists who say I'm a sexologist, <laughs> who teach, who teach that the orgasm is good, it is healthy, even they promote masturbation. They say, oh, yeah, yeah, you have to masturbate, you know, because it's good for you. Well, they don't realize what we are talking about. They don't realize that they are contributing to destroy our immune system with the wrong way of understanding sexuality. So this is extremely important. So now we are introducing people into a new approach, which is also scientific, but it is also far away from becoming superior beings. But in reality, what happened to the Oneida community in New York after 30 years when they procreated many, many children in that community, all those children were geniuses compared with average individuals. They were superior beings. But when well, we well, get... We, we know of Gnostic children too who were of born... Of course. Who well, are, Gnostic are children are actually very, very much, special. much more powerful. Yes. Much more powerful. Yes. But this is a step, you know, into a higher understanding of real sexuality. You know, we need to talk about, because in reality, the sexual energy is everywhere in the universe. It's the same solar energy. Planets are alive. 
sent to the solar energy. Without it, we wouldn't be alive. It's the same sexual energy. We wouldn't be alive if we didn't have the sexual energy. According to religions, it's the same Holy Spirit of Christianity. In other religions, you know, in the Jewish religion, they call it Bina. Bina is the Holy Spirit. In the Hindu religion, the Holy Spirit is what? Brahma Shiva, the Shiva. Lord Shiva is the Holy Spirit. So it's a force, it's a divine force that lives within ourselves. It's the same sexual energy, it's the same electricity of the body. When we die, don't we become a cold cadaver because the fire is gone? The electricity of the body is gone. When we are getting older, don't we have, don't we produce less electricity as when we were younger? But if we can really, if we can really, you see, practice this new technique that religions call it, you know, in India, as we said, Kundalini Yoga, Tantra Yoga in Buddhism, in Tibet, or in Japan, you know, or... You're, you're saying that this is new, but in, in actuality, it's only new to people in the Western world right now, but it's not new to people hundreds of years ago. That's correct. It's actually more than that, because, you know, because the ancient Egyptians practiced this. This is why they created a society of geniuses. They had the, not the scientific knowledge to explore the universe, to create those pyramids, to create a fantastic, incredible civilization. You see, and they left 25,000 years ago. So they left a little puzzle behind. We're still to this day wondering how the pyramids were made. And this little puzzle is that, uh, hmm, maybe these people knew something about controlling nature. Right? Of course, they knew exactly what we are talking about right now. <laughs> You see? And this is why this is extremely important. Now, this is another important thing, you know, regarding anthropology. You know, in Gnostic anthropology, this is a taste of Gnostic anthropology again. Darwin's theory of evolution, you know, we disagree with it because not only Darwin, but his followers like Mr. Huxley convinced themselves that we descend from monkeys. And in reality, we don't. And their strongest argument is that Monkeys, the, the amount of, in our cell, in their cell, and our cell, our human cell, there are a number of chromosomes which are very similar. In reality, you know, monkeys have 20, no, sorry, 48 chromosomes in their cell, and we have only 46. But what we tell the world through Gnostic studies, Gnostic anthropology, Gnostic sexuality, Gnostic sexology, Gnostic biology, is that what if the other way around, that monkeys descended from degenerated human beings from the past? And you see, why do they have 48 chromosomes and we have only 46? Because we are moving, we are higher. We didn't get here through the evolution of the monkeys. It's the opposite, the other way around. The monkeys are more physical and we are moving into a more spiritual universe. So we also have 48 chromosomes, but there are two chromosomes which are more etheric. So 48 is a cosmic law. We are ruled by 48 cosmic laws. And monkeys also, except that monkeys, they are connected with something that happened in the past. Are, you, are we aware, we are going to be talking in the future about the Atlanteans, a civilization that disappeared a long time ago. The Bible speaks about that, you know. They call it the flood in the Bible. Well, that happened a million years ago. But also, the Atlanteans had a second catastrophe 25,000 years ago, connected with the Egyptians. And 10,000 years ago, there was a third catastrophe, where the geography of the planet Earth changed drastically. This is why the man of Nardental, the man of Cromagnon, they were cave people, but are they our ancestors or they are just degenerated species that descended from people like us or maybe more advanced than we were? Survivors from those global catastrophes where there were earthquakes, you know, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, and the cities were destroyed and people had to run to the mountains and lived in caves. But can you imagine if you live in a cave for a thousand years? Whether, whether you live in cave for many thousands of years, 
So you are descendant will are going to be born in the middle of the forest, in the middle of nowhere. And of course, you will have to, you become a cave person. But also, don't you go into a stage of degeneration? What if you had sexual relationship with animals? You know, today is happening. Allow me to say it, but all venereal disease is coming from sexuality between people and animals. Did you know that gonorrhea is coming from sex between people and dogs? Do you know that other venereal disease is coming from sex with other kind of animals? So it's happening now. It means that it is possible that new species can be developed by doing that. What about if some crazy scientist, and we know it is happening already, doing genetic experiment where women like us, like our actual species, were impregnated with semen from monkeys to create maybe a, an army of crazy individuals who won't care about dying, killing, killing machines. Well, we know it is happening already because of the business of war. So, you see, that happened also in the past. So monkeys are degenerated human beings. Don't we like it? Do we feel offended? Well, why not? But are we talking the truth? Are we exploring new avenues then? We never cared about them in the past. Also, Mr. Darwin never recognized the law of involution. He only spoke about evolution. Who criticized Mr. Darwin was Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur criticized Darwin, saying Mr. Darwin never saw the degenerated process of nature. What a species degenerate, for example. You know, a tree is a baby tree growing up. It's a plant, becomes a tree. But then the tree, after many years, becomes old and eventually will collapse and die. Same thing happens with us. Are we evolving when we are 60, 70, 80, or 90? Or have we entered into a stage of degeneration? And we should call it involution instead of evolution. This is the cosmic law that Mr. Darwin never wanted to see. But Mr. Pasteur saw it clearly. And we, within Gnostic anthropology, also agree with Mr. Pasteur completely. So this is why animal sexuality, which is losing our semen, contributes to the degeneration of our actual human race. This is why we are in a big trouble. This is why sexuality has to be re-studied again. And we have to disagree with the corporate world who is promoting the business of medicine, selling pills and selling, you know, anti-conception, you know, methods which don't really work and finding the most natural way of doing it, which is what we are proposing. Based on these discoveries of people who were scientists, they were not ignorant people. They were very intelligent individuals. You know, this is extremely important because otherwise the future of our human race will be are we all going to become monkeys in the future? This is an important question that we should all ask ourselves. If we continue acting sexually the way we are, you know, most of my best friends, people my age, I'm considered a, a retired man already. I'm over 65. Most of my friends my age died of cancer. And when I told them, you know, don't lose your semen, don't have so many sexual partners, they didn't listen, they were laughing. Well, you know, they all died of cancer. Cancer is a virus, it's a molecular virus, too small to be discovered. But when we experience the orgasm, when we, when we experience ejaculation, don't we experience a horrible destruction of our entire system? Those people who are studying endocrinology, bringing endocrinology back into the medical field, into the bio biological field, a true scientific perception of who we really are. You know, what if we are all designed to become supermen, superwomen? Well, we are blocking that capability by doing the wrong thing with the most fundamental function, which is procreation. What are we doing to ourselves? That's extremely important, something to meditate. You know, a lot of microbiologists would be listening to what you said about venereal disease is caused by uh, improper use of sex, and they would be saying, oh, that guy is, is 
not not uh, he, he doesn't know what he's talking about because we know where all these things come from. We see it in the laboratory in the petri dishes, and we study these microorganisms, so we know exactly where all these things come from. So this guy, he's not telling us the truth, is he? That's that's that that that's what a microbiologist would say, listening to what you just said a little while ago. So how do we reconcile this? How do we? I mean, most most microbiologists, as, as a matter of fact, most physicists. They, they look at their particle accelerators and they see particles disappearing and reappearing like magic. The particles disappear into space and new particles appear and they don't realize that what they're looking at is a multi-dimensional experiment existing in multi-dimensional space. Well, uh, how do you reconcile with the microbiologist? I mean, we know that these small bugs, these small things, they're not just in the physical world, they're in all of the dimensions at the same time, right? Yeah, but you know, I, I do agree with what you said 100%, you know. Mm -hmm. Essentially, what's happening with medicine right now, they have divided and subdivided the field, you know. And this is wrong, because the founders of Western medicine, they disagree with that. Even there are books written by Galeno from ancient Greece, you know, Paracelsus from... Uh, sw sw uh, actually, the Swedish, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. Swedish uh, scientists, and also Hippocrates, another Greek, you know, scientist at that time, and they said clearly: when we divide and subdivide medicine into different fields, we lose the perception of reality, yeah. and we don't understand, you know. And this is the trouble with the microbiologists. You know, they are like in prison within a laboratory convinced that they are you know supermen superwomen rediscovering life when they are not because you know for example gonorrhea as we said it before is a venereal disease coming from dogs and dogs carry it normally <laughs> they can tolerate that virus it doesn't kill them no. but if we get it it doesn't belong to us of course it will kill us if we don't and I eliminated. Yeah. You know, what about AIDS? Do you know that the virus of AIDS is carried by monkeys? You see the point? So monkeys, some kind of an experiment, as I said, between human beings and monkeys, probably semen of monkeys was introduced into the genitals of women in an experiment called scientific well, that poor woman got AIDS and transmitted that AIDS to many other people. Well, even Louis Pasteur said in the end, when he was on his deathbed, he said, uh, it's not the microorganism, it's the terrain. In other words, it's, it's the, the host, it's your body. It's that, that allows the microorganism, right? That's correct. Mm. That's correct. You see, this is also something very important that our scientists are too much three-dimensional. And this is a crime against science because already it's been discovered that are parallel dimension. There is a fourth dimension. There is a fifth dimension. We enter already into the fourth dimension, which is the etheric universe. And we can prove it. You know, Albert Einstein proved their reality, their existence, its existence. And today, through the internet, through our cell phones, television, radio, you know, we all enter within the fourth dimension, an electro electromagnetic field, a parallel dimension, the fourth dimension. What about the fifth dimension, a molecular dimension? You see, and this is why cancer is a molecular virus. So our scientists have to enter into that field to amplify their knowledge about reality. This is one problem, you know, this is one serious problem. So our ed educators, in universities, they have to be re-educated to expand their capability to understand the universe and life. You see, and this is extremely important. The trouble is universities are very much, they are private, most of them, and they are ruled by the corporate world. And the corporate world is more concerned about profit than about, you know, discovering the real reality of all realities. And this is extremely fundamental, you know, for all of us. 
So there was a song, the, the title of this lecture is Sex, A Stairway to to Heaven and A Stairway to Hell, right? That's so correct. there was a song by that uh, name too, Stairway to Heaven. So, yes. <laughs> but uh, that, that just happens to be. Um, In interesting. So we could, how would we sum it all up? I mean, could you say that the vast majority of people in the world have been using sex incorrectly? And so therefore the discovery of going up, the discovery of ascending the stairway is something that the vast majority of people on this earth right now don't know about. You know, yes, allow me to say that. You know, I'm not, I'm not a genius. I'm not a superman. I'm just a human being searching for the truth. Who has a, I have experienced many things in my own life. As I said, I'm a senior already. So I've been, you know, I've been a student of Gnostic anthropology for more than 30 years. And you learn something after that. And, you know, this is extremely important, you know, according to Gnostic anthropology, what happened during the moment of ejaculation or the orgasm, either male or female, during the moment of expelling our semen, where millions of atoms, the best quality atoms of the body are being wasted. Because if we wanted to procreate, we needed only one spermatozoa, not seven million. Well, to compensate the, the loss, because we are losing our own life. We, the body, the genital, we in, will inhale, are going to inhale atomic particles from out of the body or, for, or from the other body of the sexual partner that don't belong to our, our organism. But most of the time we inhale atomic particles from the, the earth and also from the air. And those atomic particles don't belong to us. They are lower level, you know, of life. So, and this lower level of life enters within our genitals and through our blood and our electrical connections within the body will travel within the system and will contaminate us all over. That's the way we create what we call the ego. The ego is an inferior nature. It's an animal psychology. And that animal psychology is the cause of disturbance within ourselves and balance psychologically the foundation of war, injustice, crime, even we can even call it evil. And of course, we created it with our own wrong lifestyle. For people who accept the possibility that we've been here already many lifetimes, and there are cosmic hierarchies in the universe that are also watching us and helping us to live our lives. Well, you know, basically, if we've been here before, we will carry the mistakes of past lives losing our energies. This is why there are children that are born defective. You know, when scientists say that the strongest spermatozoa is the one who procreate life, we say, no, wrong. It's not the strongest spermatozoa because many children are coming into the world very weak compared with average children. So it means that who comes back, who comes into this world is the one who has to come according to the law of cause and effect. So basically, if losing our sexual energies will destroy our actual life, it means that in past lives, we also carried, you know, these negative energies into our actual, you know, our actual life. And this is why, you know, this is the cause of illnesses. You know, I know some people who've been studying Chinese medicine actually here in Canada. And they told me that they were studying ancient Chinese medicine, not modern Chinese, ancient Chinese. And they were told in those classes of Chinese medicine that all the entire cause, the supreme cause of illness, all kinds of illnesses, is losing our sexual energies, either through masturbation, through fornication, or even adultery. When we exchange couples, we also get the bad energy, you know, the negative energy, from the sexual partner but we also get the good but when we have a relationship with only one one sexual partner from the opposite sex of course then if we develop a loving relationship of course we can help each other to transcend and to ascend together because this is also something very important people say clearly they say oh i'm only a human i'm only a human so we all make mistake it is true we all make mistake but we are not even humans if we carry the, the animal psychology within, practicing animal sex, because fornication, we can call it animal sex. 
instead of real human sex. Of course, we develop the psychology of an animal, so we are not even humans. We should call ourselves intellectual animals. Do we feel offended because we say that? Probably yes, but let's be realistic. We have to learn to be human because when we were born, we had the blueprint to become a human. If we know that we have 12 senses, potentially, instead of five senses, and the seven superior senses are connected with the seven endocrine glands that are atrophied. Why are they atrophied? Because of losing our sexual energies. Instead of reinforcing those, they will make us geniuses, all of us, a humanity of geniuses. Isn't it possible? Of course. Then Can we I... would be able to create paradise on earth. Can I tell a silly little story? Of course. The silly little story is the ugly duckling. Now, everyone's going to say, well, we've all heard this story before, but maybe someone hasn't. So the, the ugly duckling was raised by a little family of black ducklings. And it, they were always, this one bird didn't belong to that family. And so the other ducklings always looked at this one duckling as being the ugly one, right? Until they all grew up. And then this one ugly duckling saw two swans on, on the pond. And then it realized that it was a swan, it wasn't a duck at all. And so basically what you're describing here with human humanity right now is we are all swans, but we think we're ugly ducklings, you know? <laughs> I don't correct. know if that works or not. That's correct. No, I, I do agree with that 100%, you know. Of course, that's the way it is. As, as I said, as we said it before, we are all designed to become supermen, superwomen, but we behave like ants. Insects that live a mechanical lifestyle. And this is wrong. Of course it's wrong. So time has come now to wake up, to shake ourselves, and to experience a psychological a revolution of our soul. Psychological revolution. Because evolution is not enough to ascend. We need to reinforce, you know, who we are. To rediscover who we are. And to stop living, as I said, a mechanical lifestyle. And to learn to become creative because we've been designed to be creative, to be able to ascend into higher levels of being. Thank you very much, Jim. You have been listening to a special episode of Gnostic Lectures. The website, of course, is rickyradio.com and the email is gnosticradio at gmail.com. Uh, today we have been listening to Mr. E. Jim G. Ross. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, Rick. Thank you very much again for your patience and for your great invitation to allow me to be here. Thanks to our listeners. I really appreciate also that you've been here with us. So I wish you all the best and let's fight for the truth. Because the truth must be, you know, unveiled for all of us.